Well, I was one of many, many people who worked on it through generations. The 1913 group of Niska who made the first uh, attempt to have their land approved lost the argument. They never lost their faith over the years, and this was part of the huge change that came in the administration of First Nations across Canada, but in British Columbia, where we did not have any treaties to speak of. Uh, all the land was unceded and unnegotiated, and so the, the, the founders of the vision of this achievement began, I think, about the, after World War II and after they uh, had gathered their forces once again in the Nishka Tribal Council to gain the respect and gain the control of their own environment. They used to say, we've seen 50 years of logs being taken out of our valley and no value to us. Uh, we have a right to have our um, four villages incorporated into a government. I think it was uh, inspired leadership on their part that made this happen. And also, there was a great upswelling of hope in the Niska. They had to contribute their own resources to this. It was a huge amount of money that had to be raised for the court cases and so on that ensued. And I've always admired them for the tenacity of their uh, search to realize their vision. And it's wonderful to sit here now after all these years coming up Highway 113 after 113 years of negotiating and knowing all the people who worked to make this happen. And, the, and I think something that's rarely spoken about is during that long period, there was never an occasion for discourtesy on the f part of the Niska. They were always cordial and uh, the hospitality of the people was always accorded. And they used to say that this was a struggle to get into Canada, while other people were saying, oh, they just want to be separated, you know. Well, that wasn't the case. They wanted to be a living, breathing part of Canada, but they wanted it on their terms. And sitting here today, after all this time in this beautiful um, building of administration, dedicated to some of those founders. The boardroom is dedicated to Frank Calder and the, and the other historic, uh, um, leaders are all shown one way or another in the anterooms and in the hallways. No one is forgotten. And that's an important part of the realization of this, to them, sacred valley. There was a time when Niska and other First Nations were not allowed to have political meetings. They were forbidden under law to have political meetings. And so the Anglican Church over there served as a meeting hall, and they would start every meeting with the first chorus of, Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. And now it is their eternal home. I'm learning it's a wonderful thing to walk in and find the son of my old friend who I once knew as a child who was a very well-educated man and became principal of his school and there's his son here, Alvin McKay and his son Kevin McKay who is an administrator here. It's wonderful to see the generations. I left a note for my old friend Harry Nice who was the cultural negotiator for the Niska who recently won a battle against the National Museum of Civilization that was going to take his family fish boat out of the museum as being irrelevant. It has now been put back in. I think it's important that we say that each generation is supplanted by a new generation with new responsibilities and a wholly new uh, uh, set of challenges to face, but they're here and they have the great tradition to follow on. And so I'm very hopeful as I sit here. <laughs>